Smeagol killed his cousin, Deagol, right? In The Lord of the Rings, the two towers are Orthanc and Barad-dûr. That Lord of the Eagles who shows up in The Hobbit to rescue Gandalf and the dwarves, he is Gwaihir the Wind Lord. Except, no. Actually, none of that is what Tolkien wrote. These are all Middle-earth misconceptions. Maya Govan and Melanine, and welcome to a Top 10 Tolkien Myths Untangled video. In the decades since the Professor's most iconic books were first published, a few inevitable misconceptions have arisen. Some of these are the result of other authors writing inaccurately about Tolkien. For example, we are told that Deagle was the cousin of Smeagol, as if that were a fact in David Day's Tolkien the Illustrated Encyclopedia, despite the fact that in Lord of the Rings, Tolkien only ever describes Deagle as being Smeagol's friend. In Letter 214, Tolkien does tell us that Deagle was evidently a relative, as no doubt all the members of the small community were, but that's a far cry from Deagle was his cousin. And quick side note, there are a lot of misconceptions in David Day's books. He is, hmm, how can I say this politely, he's not very well respected within certain circles of the Tolkien community. His books contain a notoriously high number of, like, made-up things. Anyway, some other misconceptions arise due to iconic adaptations, such as the two towers being portrayed as Orthanc and Barad-dûr in Peter Jackson's movies. In the book, Tolkien states explicitly that the two towers are in fact Orthanc and Minas Mordegul. But Minas Mordegul doesn't appear in Peter Jackson's The Two Towers, and so for reasons that I think do make a lot of sense really, the second tower in the movies became Sauron's Tower in Mordor. Over the years, these movies have cemented themselves within the public consciousness, and so more misconceptions are born. And finally, some misconceptions are just very cool pieces of speculation that would be really, really nice if they were true, but unfortunately, they just aren't. If Gwaihir were the Lord of the Eagles in The Hobbit, it would tie the Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and the Silmarillion together. It would give Gwaihir more to do, and it would be very cool, but it just can't be. In Lord of the Rings, Gandalf tells us he's only ridden Gwaihir twice before picking up Frodo and Sam from Mount Doom, but that just wouldn't check out if Gwaihir were the same Lord of the Eagles from The Hobbit. So here are 10 more Middle Earth misconceptions debunked. Starting at number 10. Elves cannot give up their immortality. They cannot just choose a mortal life. I mean, all right, Arwen does in the Third Age, and so does her uncle Elros, aka Numenor's first ever king in the Second Age, and also in the First Age, Luthien Tinuviel totally does go from immortal to mortal. But these are all super specific cases, and technically neither Arwen nor Elros nor Luthien are actually 100% elven. Arwen is able to choose a mortal life because she is the daughter of Elrond, half-elven. Elrond and his brother Elros were born to a father who was himself half-elf, half-man, and to a mother who was a slightly more complicated mix of part-elf, part-man, also little part Maya. Because these two brothers, Elrond and Elros, are so mixed in their heritage, they are given the choice, the privilege, of choosing whether to be counted among the kindreds of elves or men. Elros chose mortality, and so he and all his descendants are counted among the race of men. His descendants become the kings of Numenor. Elrond obviously made the opposite choice, and he was granted the immortal life of an elf. However, whereas the mortal descendants of Elros are locked into mortality for they belong to the race of men, the immortal children of Elrond half-elven are still given the choice of their father. They are counted among the Eldar from birth, but they alone of all elves 
are able to opt out, to renounce their immortality. Obviously, Arwen does do exactly that for the sake of love, and Tolkien never actually told us what became of her brothers, Eladan and Elrohir, but like Galadriel, for example, Legolas, Thranduil, Gil-galad, every other elf of the first, second, and third ages except Elrond, they are all immortals by nature. Their bodies can be slain, but their spirits are bound to Arda. They cannot pass beyond the circles of the world, as all mortals must. And they do not have a choice to change that. But what then about Luthien Tinuviel? She did choose a mortal life, and she is not a descendant of Elrond's. Well, yeah, very true. But again, Luthien is about as exceptional as any elf could possibly be. There is nothing ordinary about Luthien Tinuviel. Just like Elrond, Luthien is technically only half elven. Her father was an elf, but her mother was one of the Maya, one of the angelic sort of demigods of the same order as Sauron and the Balrogs. However, unlike Elrond, Luthien was not simply given the choice to relinquish her immortality, she took it. She made it happen. The tale of Beren and Luthien is a very long one, and if you want the full details, I do have an 11 video playlist explaining it in full, but for now, I will say that at the end of the story, they both die. But Luthien, as an elf, she dies in the immortal kind of way. Her body falls lifeless in Middle-earth, but her spirit is summoned to the halls of Mandos in the uttermost west, where it should be held and judged and, in the case of good elves, rehoused into a new body, to live again in the undying lands. Beren, on the other hand, he dies a mortal death. His spirit is briefly held in the halls of Mandos, but then it must depart beyond the circles of the world and return to Iluvatar outside of creation. The eventual fate of men is unknown even to the Valar. But Luthien really, really loved Beren. So she did something that no being has ever done before or again after. She sang a song so beautiful that the immovable Mandos was moved to pity. She convinced the gods, effectively, to make an exception for her and Beren. And so, eventually, with the permission of Iluvatar himself, Beren and Luthien were both allowed to return to Middle-earth to live a second life together. But the catch was that they had to do so as mortals. They must live one lifetime together, and then they must both pass together beyond the circles of the world. And the reason that this is relevant to Arwen, Eleros, and Elrond is because the granddaughter of Beren and Luthien, she was that half-elven woman who married that half-elven guy, and together they created the very half-elven twins, Elrond and Eleros. So, with the very specific exceptions of Luthien, Eleros, Arwen, and maybe Eladan and Elrohir, who are all technically half-elves of the same family, the elves of Middle-earth cannot choose to go from immortal to mortal. They cannot change the way their spirits were created by Iluvatar. And while we are on the topic of Iluvatar, number nine. Elrond did not summon the Council of Elrond. So this is one of those misconceptions that I think is born straight out of Peter Jackson's movies. In the first movie, Elrond says at the Council of Elrond, you have been summoned here to answer the threat of Mordor. And in an extended scene from the second movie, Denethor confirms that Elrond has called a meeting because the weapon of the enemy has been found. According to the movies, Boromir went to Rivendell to attend this meeting. He knew about the ring from the start, and presumably the other people at the council were all also summoned to Rivendell for that same purpose. But this is not what Tolkien wrote. In the book, 
At the beginning of the council, Elrond says, The Ring. That is the doom that we must deem. That is the purpose for which you are called hither. Called, I say, though I have not called you to me, strangers from distant lands, you have come and are here met, in this very nick of time, by chance, as it may seem, yet it is not so. Believe rather that it is so ordered that we, who sit here and none others, must now find counsel for the peril of the world. This theme of chance, if chance it were, so in other words, not chance, instead the designs of Iluvatar, it's a hugely important part of the Lord of the Rings, and it makes the Council of Elrond a lot more special in, like, the grand scheme of things. The people who happened to be there aren't foreign dignitaries that Elrond summoned for his council. He didn't invite elves and dwarves and men there. His invites to, like, Theoden of Rohan and King Brand of Dale, they didn't get lost in the post. It's much more profound than that. There are a whole host of reasons that have, seemingly by chance, yet it is not so, brought these strangers from distant lands together, and fate has determined that these individuals and non-others should be the ones who deem the doom of the ring. The only reason Gimli even came to Rivendell was because his father Glowin was going, and the reason Glowin made the journey was A, in the hopes of finding out about Barlin's mysterious expedition to Moria, but also B, to see his buddy Bilbo, and to give him a heads up that there are some dodgy dudes from Mordor looking for a halfling called Baggins. Legolas came to Rivendell to deliver the bad news that Gollum had escaped his imprisonment by the Wood Elves of Mirkwood, and Boromir was only there because he and his brother had received really weird dreams, telling them to seek the sword that was broken in Imladris. However, Tolkien's point is that all these individual players are part of a much bigger picture. Iluvatar designed creation in such a way that the perfect combination of strangers must all happen to meet on just the right day, in just the right place, and because they do, the ring is destroyed. The Council of Elrond isn't an argumentative meeting of Middle-earth's bigwigs, it wasn't summoned by Elrond himself, it was designed by a far higher power. And instead of devolving into bickering, as it does in the movies, the council eventually devolves into silence. The ring has to be destroyed, but who will do it? Frodo sits in the silence. He feels an overwhelming desire to stay in Rivendell, to find peace at Bilbo's side, but then he opens his mouth, and as if some other will were using his small voice, Iluvatar, <coughs> Frodo says, I will take the ring to Mordor, though I do not know the way. There is only one way the ring could have been destroyed, only one way to achieve a happy ending. And this disparate group of strangers from distant lands who by chance happen to find themselves in Rivendell on October the 25th, they are the only combination of people who could get us to it. It's a major theme in all the great tales of Middle-earth. Iluvatar knows what he's doing. Number 8. Sauron is not incorporeal. At the time of the Lord of the Rings, he does have a body. Considering that he is the Lord of the Rings, Sauron does not get a whole lot of page time in that story. Throughout most of it, he's a name that is mentioned in fear. He's an idea, a kind of far-off threat, but he totally does have a physical form, and he totally does appear directly on the page in one scene, he has lines of dialogue with one of our main characters. But not as a giant fiery eyeball. In most instances, the lidless eye is no more a literal description of Sauron's physical form 
then the white hand is a description of Saruman's. It's a symbol and a metaphor. However, to be fair, the great eye wreathed in flame thing is not invented out of nothing. During his time in Lothlorien, Frodo looks into the mirror of Galadriel and among other things, he saw an eye rimmed with fire, yellow as a cat's, watchful and intent, and the black slit of its pupil opened on a pit, a window into nothing. So the Eye of Sauron is, at least in some way, a literal eye. But whereas it's often portrayed as being totally absent, any kind of a corresponding body, we know that this is not the case for Sauron as Tolkien wrote him. Even at the end of the Third Age, Sauron does have a physical form. And there comes a moment in the story where he actually shares some dialogue with one of our hobbits, but, interestingly, not Frodo. It is when Pippin looks into the Palantir that he sees Sauron looking back at him in real time. He hears his voice. And this is not a vision. It's not a dream. It is pretty much a face-to-face -face conversation between Pippin and Sauron via their respective Palantiri. Like a video call. Except, instead of audio, they have scary psychic thought projection. And so, Pippin is the only character within The Lord of the Rings to have an on-page interaction with the Dark Lord. But, if you want a description of what Sauron's physical form looks like, well, we know he has a cat-like eye, assuming that what Frodo saw in the mirror of Galadriel was literal, but beyond that, I'm afraid details are pretty scarce. In letter 144, Tolkien wrote that in the year 1000 of the Third Age, so 2000 years before the Lord of the Rings, the shadow of Sauron began first to grow again a new shape. And in letter 246, he wrote that Sauron should be thought of as very terrible. The form that he took was that of a man, of more than human stature, but not gigantic. Aside from that, we really only get one other piece of info, but it really sticks with me. In The Two Towers, Frodo mentions to Gollum that it was Isildur who cut off the finger of the enemy. And Gollum replies, yes, he has only four on his black hand, but they are enough. And I can't really say why, but this line always makes me shiver. For whatever reason, Sauron does not reform the finger that Sildur cut off 3,000 years ago. Nine fingers is something that both Sauron and Frodo will come to share. But I think the truly creepy implication here is that Gollum knows this. We are told that he was once captured by the enemy and tortured in Mordor, but the fact that Gollum knows exactly how many fingers Sauron has suggests, at least to me, that Gollum has come face to face with Sauron. Perhaps Sauron tortured Gollum in person. Number seven. Destroying Middle-earth? is not what Sauron wants. I think understanding Sauron's motives is really important in appreciating his character, and it's simply not true to say that if Sauron reclaimed the ring, he would end the world. That is not what he is about. Total annihilation, destruction of all things, that's kind of the opposite of what Sauron is shooting for. Absolute destruction is what motivated Sauron's former master, Morgoth. And the difference between Sauron's motive and Morgoth's is a fascinating insight into their fundamental personalities. There is a section of an essay in the history of Middle-earth called Notes on Motives in the Silmarillion. And in those notes, Tolkien wrote, Thus, as Morgoth was confronted by the existence of other inhabitants of Ardida, aka elves and men, he was enraged by the mere fact of their existence. His sole, ultimate object was their destruction. Basically, Morgoth was like that tyrant toddler who would rather break his favourite toy than let anyone else touch it. He wanted to be the number one most 
powerful thing in creation, but because he's not Iluvatar, he never can be. So instead, he adopted a policy that is all about discord and ruin and perversion and destruction. However, Sauron, he is the opposite. Sauron is, at the end of the day, a craftsman and a creator. In those same notes on motives, Tolkien wrote that Sauron had never reached Morgoth's stage of nihilistic madness. He did not object to the existence of the world so long as he could do what he liked with it. He still had the relics of positive purposes that descended from the good of the nature in which he began. It had been his virtue, and therefore also the cause of his fall and of his relapse, that he loved order and coordination and disliked all confusion and wasteful friction. In other words, Sauron wanted to do good. He wanted to craft the world into something that he considered perfect. But he needed power to do it. And over time, as is so often the case, the means to his end eventually turned into the end in and of itself. Mordegoth was motivated by envy. Envy turned to shame. Shame led to hatred, and hatred gave way to destruction. However, Sauron was motivated by a desire to craft perfection. But perfection requires order, and order can only be enforced through control. And in the case of Sauron and tens of thousands of others in the real world, control slowly turned into dominion. Number six. The Arkenstone is not a Silmaril. So, there is a common theory that I'm sure you've heard before, suggesting that one of the First Age Silmarils, presumably the one that was thrown into a fiery chasm after the War of Wrath, somehow got transported by, I don't know, shifting tectonic plates, I guess? But according to this theory, geological forces moved a Silmaril of the First Age about a thousand miles under the Earth to the Lonely Mountain, which, again, according only to this theory, is lonely because it is actually a dormant volcano. And then, about five and a half thousand years later, some dwarves of the Lonely Mountain rediscovered this First Age Silmaril, and they called it the Arkenstone. And this is a really cool theory. I think just like Gwaihir being the Lord of the Eagles from The Hobbit, having the Arkenstone be a Silmaril ties different stories together in a pretty neat way. It feels satisfying, and it makes the Legendarium feel more like one super long narrative. Also, there are some similarities between the Arkenstone and the Silmarils. They are both super precious jewels, they both glow with their own internal light, and they are both coveted by powerful kings who ultimately meet sticky ends. However, if we look at the specifics of what Tolkien wrote, I think we can say with near certainty that the Arkenstone is not one of the lost Silmarils. Firstly, we are told that the Arkenstone was cut by the dwarfs into a multifaceted jewel. But the Silmarils are unbreakable. They definitely cannot be chipped away at to change their shape. Secondly, we are explicitly told in the Silmarillion that the lost Silmarils would remain lost until the ending of Arda. But I think the most damning piece of evidence against this theory is the fact that all three of the Silmarils were hallowed by Elbereth Gilthorniel, the Queen of Light and Stars. Which means they will burn any unclean flesh or mortal hand that touches them. That's a massive part of the plot. But in The Hobbit, loads of mortal hands touch the Arkenstone, some of them not particularly amazing people. If it were a Silmaril, surely it must burn them. I know that Beren was a mortal man in the Silmarillion, and he totally did touch his Silmaril without being burned by it, but A, that's the point of the story, he had Iluvatar on his side, and B, don't forget, Beren did lose the hand that held the Silmaril, he did not get off scot-free. Mortals can't just touch a Silmaril without facing consequences, 
And for that reason, I think we can say with a fair degree of certainty that the Arkenstone is not a Silmaril. However, there is another dimension to this question, because from an in-universe Middle-Earth perspective, yeah, nah, the Arkenstone is definitely not a Silmaril. But from a real-world Tolkien perspective, there is more that needs to be said. Tolkien's earliest writings that can be considered part of the Silmarillion, i.e. involving Silmarils, were put to pen decades before he began writing The Hobbit. But those Silmarillion writings were not first written with the intention of being published. They began as a private mythology, a personal hobby of Tolkien's, a vehicle with which he could explore his primary passion, language. And in some of those language notes that can be found dated to around the same time The Hobbit was being written, Tolkien translated bits of his Silmarillion stuff into the Old English language of the Anglo-Saxons. And the Old English word that Tolkien chose to translate Silmaril into was Eorklanstan. And Eorklanstan shares an etymology with the real-world Old Norse word Jarkenstein, which Tolkien then anglicised and modernised into Arkenstone. So, it is fair to say that the Arkenstone and the Silmarils inhabited a similar space in Tolkien's brain. He definitely was thinking about one while writing the other. I suppose we could say that the Arkenstone in The Hobbit kind of represents an analogue with the Silmarils of the Silmarillion. They are not the same thing, but Tolkien clearly took heavy inspiration from his private mythology whilst constructing The Hobbit. And we see this elsewhere. You know, the Woodland King, who was later named as Thranduil, that definitely isn't the same character as the Silmarillion's Woodland King, Eluthingol, but there's a definite parallel. Thranduil's underground woodland halls that were originally made by dwarves are not the same as Thingol's underground woodland halls that were originally made by dwarves, but there is a clear parallel. And I think it's the same with the Arkenstone and the Silmarils. So, although it is a misconception to say that the Arkenstone is a Silmaril, it's also a bit of a misconception to say that they are completely unrelated. Number 5 the peoples of Middle-earth do not use our Gregorian calendar. It's a very good question. Why did Tolkien, who put so much effort into building a secondary world, not invent his own calendar? Why do his characters use the same months that we do? Well, the answer to that is that Tolkien totally did invent his own calendar. In fact, he invented quite a few different calendars used by different communities. The reason his characters refer to the months as September or October or November has nothing to do with a lack of imagination and everything to do with an astounding attention to detail when it comes to language and translation. So, the people of Middle-earth do not speak English, obviously. They speak a load of different languages. But in The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien only translates two of them. If a character is speaking, say, Sindarin, their words are written in Sindarin. Same with Quenya and Kuzdul and Orkish. However, if a character is speaking the Rohiric language, their words are translated into Old English. And if they are speaking the common tongue, Westron, then their words are translated into modern English, or whatever language you're reading the books in. Now, the earliest calendars in Middle-earth were of elvish origin, and these are pretty alien to what we are familiar with. An elvish understanding of one year is actually 144 of our years made up of 52,596 days and 8,766 weeks. Although, interestingly, for ritual purposes, the elves only had six days in each week. But they also observed a solar year that they called a Koranar, and that did have 365 and a quarter days. Although, instead of being divided into 12 months, this was divided into six seasons. Spring, summer, autumn, fading, winter, and stirring. Now, because it is Tolkien that we are talking about here, 
everything I've just mentioned has a Quenya name and a Sindarin name and an English translation of their Westron name, which is different depending on whether we're talking about Bree or the Shire. Also, each of these names has their own etymologies and variants and fun little linguistic side notes, but even that is still only the tip of this iceberg. Because as time wore on in Middle-earth, this elven calendar was adopted and then massively reworked by the men of Numenor in the Second Age. They are the ones who made weeks seven days long, and they are the ones who divided the year into 12 months. And it's this Second Age Numenorian calendar that will, in the Third Age, evolve into quite a few different Middle-earth calendars, including the King's Reckoning of Gondor, the Steward's Reckoning of Gondor, the New Reckoning of Gondor and Arnor, and, of course, the Shire Reckoning used by Hobbits and the Men of Bree. But... Right in the middle of the nine pages where Tolkien explains some, but not even all, of these insanely complex specifics, he goes off on a bit of a tangent about how the Numenorean calendar isn't perfect. And thus, every thousand years or so, there is a millennial deficit of 4 hours, 46 minutes, and 40 seconds. Which is why the steward's reckoning became a thing. It goes insanely deep. If I were to go down this rabbit hole, I'd be talking about calendars for hours. But what I find uh, really frustrating, honestly, is that the calendars that Tolkien created, especially his Hobbit Shire Reckoning calendar, is just so much better than our own actual real-world Gregorian one. Just like with our actual calendar, the Shire Reckoning splits the Middle-earth year into 12 months. But, unlike our real-world calendar, all 12 of these months are exactly the same length. Each one is 30 days, no exceptions. If we use the Elvish language, these months have the most beautiful names. The month that we would call May is known in Quenya as Lotese, and in Sindarin as Lothron, which means flower month. And the month that we would call October is known in Quenya as Narquelie, and in Sindarin as Narabeleth, which means sun fading or sun waning. But exquisite language is not the reason I prefer Tolkien's calendar to our own. His just makes more sense. As I said, every month has 30 days. Simple. You don't need the whole rhyme to remind yourself whether there's 30 or 31 days in, like, June. There's no weird months like February. It's consistent. Although, you may have cottoned on that if every month does have 30 days, and there are 12 of them, that's only 360 days in a year. We're still missing five. And that brings us to the Lyth days. The best days of the year. In the calendar used by hobbits, we have the first six months of the year, after Yule, Solomath, Wreath, Astron, Thrimage, and Forlyth, and then you get the Lyth days. The three summer days that don't correspond to any month. They are their own thing. They are days meant only for partying and celebration. The day before Mid-Year's Day is a day of partying. And then Mid-Year's Day itself is an even bigger day of partying, and then it's followed by another day of life, which is also a day of partying. And on Leap Years, you get a fourth day of partying over life. Wouldn't it be great to have three days of every year that, like, aren't part of any month, and the only reason they exist is just to take them off and enjoy them? After the final Lyth day, we have the next six months of the year. After Lyth, Wedmath, Halimath, Winterfilth, Blotmath, and Fordyule. But that does still only account for 363 days, 64 on a leap year. There are still two days left. And these two extra days that also don't belong to any month are the Yule days. Basically, Hobbit Christmas. The first day of every new year is Yule Day, but the last day of every year is also Yule Day. So every year, as one year passes to the next, you get two Yule Days back to back, two Christmases right next to each other. 
Also, only 335 years before the events of The Lord of the Rings, there was one final reform to the Shire calendar, which again just makes things so much tidier and more convenient than what we actually get in our own calendar. The Hobbits decided that mid-year's day, and on leap years the day after it, they should not have a weekday name. You know, it's not a Saturday or a Sunday or a Monday, it's just mid-year's day. Its own separate thing. Which means that there are now only 364 days of the year that need a weekday name. And 364 divides by 7 exactly 52 times. 7 days in a week, 52 weeks in a year. What the Hobbits did was figure out a way to ensure that the days of the week and the days of the year will always sync up forever. No exceptions. A new year will always begin on a Saturday. Annual events will always fall on the same day of the week every year without fail. It's cleverer than what we have in real life. I think if I were handed absolute power over the entire planet, my first act of tyranny would be forcing this Hobbit calendar onto, like, all real-world affairs. It would be confusing at first, yeah, that's true, but every month would be exactly the same length, so that would actually simplify things in the long run, and in the middle of every year, we get three days off for partying that don't count towards any month, four days on a leap year, and when the year ends, we get two more free days to celebrate Christmas twice. With all due respect to, I don't know, it was one of the Pope Gregory's, wasn't it, who made our calendar? With all due respect to you, Tolkien created the better calendar. I will die on this hill. Number four. Elves are not cold and emotionless. This is probably another misconception that's born out of adaptations, but I feel like there's a common perception that Tolkien's elves are so otherworldly and beyond comprehension that their standard facial expression is just steely badass. They are stoic action heroes without very much at all in the way of, like, feelings. But that could not be further from the case. Tolkien's elves are typically super emotional. Legolas is possibly the best character to start with here. In Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, Legolas is probably the least developed member of the Fellowship in terms of like characterization. But one of the big things that we do see over and over again with Legolas is that he is almost indomitably cheerful. There is nothing cold about Legolas. While the Fellowship are desperately struggling to cross Karadhras and their spirits are at their lowest lows, Legolas is dancing and making jokes. He bursts out into spontaneous song multiple times in the story, and in one instance he is so emotionally moved by his own song that he has to stop singing it. He chokes himself up. Now, I'm certainly not trying to imply that Legolas isn't a badass. He is. He shoots a winged Nazgul out of the sky one time. It's incredibly badass. But he isn't some steely-eyed assassin. He is emotional to a fault, and he wears those emotions very, very openly. And Legolas is not an outlier among elves. Elrond, I think, is another elf who is often misconceived of as being super serious and severe all the time, but this does not reflect the Elrond that Tolkien wrote. In the book, Elrond is famous for his gentleness. He is as kind as summer. Rivendell is literally known for being a homely house. During Bilbo's time there, we see him joking and bantering with an elf called Lindir, and when Samwise Gamgee encounters his first ever elf, Gilador Inglorion, and Frodo asks him what he thought of the experience, Sam's response is that they are quite different from what I expected, so gay and sad, as it were. An elf's capacity for emotion is among the first things that Sam comments upon. Now, again, that's obviously not to say that all elves are unambiguously delightful. If you know anything about the Silmarillion, you will know that that's not true. But even in the case of villainous elves like Feanor, he is still really quite emotional. 
Over the life of this channel, I think I have referred to Feyenoord as a psychopath, maybe, more than once, but I don't actually think that that is a particularly accurate description. Psychopaths typically have a very dull emotional palette, but Feyenoord's emotions are as extreme as his personality. He is constantly feeling outrageous levels of anger and pride and jealousy. He may not have much of a conscience, but he certainly has emotions. Which brings us to number three. Dwarves are not funny and Scottish. This is a weird one, and it's a misconception that's not specific to Tolkien. Scottish dwarves are a thing in popular culture, same with Scottish Vikings. But the reasons for this seem to be based on nothing more than just not particularly flattering national stereotypes. But before I talk about their kind of bizarre Scottishness, I want to talk about the other misconception, the more meaningful one. Maybe, more so than any other race in Middle-earth, dwarves are not comic relief. Tolkien took his dwarves very seriously. And in The Lord of the Rings and its appendices in the Silmarillion, dwarves are massively hardcore. Historically, pre-Tolkien, dwarves in popular fiction, or dwarfs, were kinda silly. Like, that was the point of them. You know, Snow White is the protagonist of the story, her prince is the hero, the queen is the villain, and every single one of the dwarves is a joke. Even more historically than Disney, you have the dwarfs of fairy stories, creatures like Rumpelstiltskin, who is at best a kind of grumpy trickster, and at worst a monstrously evil baby thief. It's a weird story. I'm not really qualified to talk about the dwarves in C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, but I am under the impression that a good few of them are closer to the Rumpelstiltskin type of sinister dwarf than the dwarves of Durin's folk that Tolkien created in his writings. Because even more historically, dwarves, or duaro, were an integral part of ancient Germanic mythology. Sometime back in the 5th century, a bunch of these Germanic peoples hopped across the water to Britain, where they became known as the Anglo-Saxons. And the language and history and culture of these Anglo-Saxons is what Tolkien's entire academic career was about. It's where his dwarves come from. Fair enough, the dwarves of The Hobbit aren't quite as like mythologically profound as the dwarves in later Middle-earth writings, but even within the much lighter tone of The Hobbit, Thorin and his company are not funny. There are moments of levity, but they don't typically come from the dwarves. There's a tragedy and a heaviness to Tolkien's dwarves. The supposed children's story in which we're first introduced to them, The Hobbit, ends with their king and both of his young heirs dead upon the battlefield. I certainly don't want to overbash Peter Jackson's movies, that's definitely not the point of this video, but one of the characters that I enjoyed least in his trilogy was Gimli. Or at least Gimli in the later two movies. In Fellowship, I think he does add his own distinct flavour to the film, but in Two Towers and Return of the King, 90% of his character's screen time is comic relief. And look, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, it just doesn't reflect the Gimli that Tolkien wrote. I also don't want to oversteer in the opposite direction. I'm not saying there is never any moment in all of The Lord of the Rings where Gimli ever shows a lighter side. There are moments, but they are on the very periphery of his character. Gimli is first and foremost stout. He's doughty. He's loyal. But he's also kind of grim. He's honourable, but he's combative. He's a great character, but of all nine members of the Fellowship, I think it can be argued that he is the least likely to crack a joke. And if we move on to the appendices and the Silmarillion and focus on dwarves as a group rather than as individuals, we will see that there is nothing silly about them. In fact, if I had to sum up all of dwarven history in just one word, I think I would say bittersweet. The history of the dwarves is absolutely epic, and there is a good amount of variety in it. But throughout all three ages, and across The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and The Silmarillion, the main through line that we see repeated over and over 
is that the dwarves have some place or something that is massively important to their culture and their way of life. Then that thing is taken from them. They fight to get it back, and in so doing, vast numbers of them die. Usually, their king included. Some survive, and dwarves do typically win the wars they fight, but almost every dwarven victory in all of Middle-earth's history comes at a ludicrously high cost. The story of the dwarves is a somber one. They are not funny. And they are not Scottish. I guess this is less of a misconception and more just a common adaptational choice, but this phenomenon is definitely not born out of Tolkien's writings. That name, Gimli, or Durin, or Thorin, or Dwalin, or Balin, or Da'in, or Bifa, or Bofa, or Bomba, or Fili, or Kili, or Gandalf, or loads of others are real world Old Norse names. There's a historic Icelandic poem called Voluspa that Tolkien was very familiar with. And within this historic Icelandic saga, there is a catalogue of dwarves with some very familiar names. So isn't it a bit odd that dwarves have adopted such a quintessentially Scottish way of speaking within the modern fantasy genre that Tolkien himself did so much to define? And yet in his writings, they are so intimately born out of Scandinavian, Norse, and Icelandic traditions. They are bound up in Germanic mythology. Their Kuzdur language is supposedly inspired by Semitic languages such as Hebrew or Aramaic or Arabic. But for some reason, fantasy dwarves have in so many cases, adopted this strangely stereotypical Scottish persona. I mean, right, I have nothing against Scottish dwarves, it's just it's a little odd to me that there are so many non-Scottish actors who change their accents while playing dwarves despite the absolute absence of anything in Tolkien that would really give them a reason to. Weird. Number two. Mortals do not live forever in the Undying Lands. This is a sad one. If you weren't aware of this before clicking on this video, this might change how you perceive the ending of The Lord of the Rings. It is very reasonable to assume that when a person sails into the Undying Lands, they won't die. It's in the name, right? But that's not what Tolkien wrote. In fact, what he wrote is the complete opposite. The Undying Lands are so called because they are inhabited by the Undying. Elves and Maiar and Valar, they are what make the land undying, not the other way around. Just as elves cannot choose a mortal life, it is beyond the power of any being in Arda to change the fate of mortals or the nature of their spirits. And in the Silmarillion, we are actually told that if a mortal were to live in Valinor, in the Undying Lands, what remained of their lifespan would be shortened. A mortal in the Undying Lands would wither and grow weary the sooner, as moths in a light too strong and steadfast. In Letter 154, Tolkien told us that Frodo and Bilbo's journey to the uttermost west is strictly only a temporary reward, a healing and a redress of suffering. They cannot abide forever, and though they cannot return to mortal earth, they can and will die. And in an essay called A Man and Mortal Men, Tolkien wrote that in the Undying Lands, a mortal creature would be a fleeting thing, the most swift passing of all beasts, for his whole life would last little more than one half year. And while all other living creatures would seem to him hardly to change, he would rise and pass. So, this of course means that although it is a lovely thing to think about, it is an absolute misconception to imagine Samwise Gamgee being reunited with his beloved Frodo in the Undying Lands. Sam does get to sail there at the end of his life, but that's 61 years after Frodo departed. By the time Sam arrives on the shores of the uttermost west, Frodo would be long gone. Bilbo too. And by the time Gimli gets there with Legolas, Sam would be long dead as well. 
The Undying Lands are a place of peace and healing, but unless you are already undying by nature, they are a brief rest before the great unknown that is death. Passing beyond the circles of the world and returning to Iluvatar, as all mortals must. Something that the undying cannot experience themselves. And this may seem really quite depressing, but I don't think it should be. I think it's an excellent example of what Tolkien does best. It's not hopeless, but it is bittersweet. Lord of the Rings is often imagined as being a massive, sprawling epic, and there certainly is massive epicness orbiting all about it, but at its core, I would say that Lord of the Rings is a beautifully tragic tale of death and decline. It just happens to be wearing the disguise of a happy ending. Which finally brings us to number one. Lord of the Rings is not a fantasy trilogy. I mean, it kind of is the most iconic fantasy trilogy of all time, but I would argue that neither fantasy nor trilogy are really the most accurate words to describe it. I'll start with trilogy. Obviously, in most instances, The Lord of the Rings is published in three volumes, Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and Return of the King, so a trilogy. But that's not how it was written. Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings as six books, six parts of one whole. It was his intention that all six of these books would be published together in one great tome, and that would be THE Lord of the Rings. But that tome would have been over 1,200 pages long, and in the post-war 1950s Britain, where this was first published, Paper and ink and publishing supplies, everything really, was in very short supply. Also, Lord of the Rings was originally commissioned as a sequel to The Hobbit, which has only like 300 pages, and back in 1954, The Hobbit and a few other children's stories were really the only things that Tolkien was commercially known for. So, Tolkien's publishers made the fateful decision to divide his great tome into separate books, but not into six. Instead, they bundled the six books into pairs, and they published each of those pairs as one of three volumes. These volumes have become known as the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and, well, from a commercial perspective, that was a great idea. Lord of the Rings sold really, really well. But from a creative perspective, Tolkien didn't love it. Each one of his six books has its own identity. Tolkien had his own titles for them, and I do agree that it is a bit arbitrary to lump, like, books three and four together, for example, into one volume and call that the two towers, as if books three and four are somehow particularly similar, whereas books two and five, they belong in separate parts of a trilogy. A trilogy is not what this is, it's not what Tolkien wrote, and dividing the story into three after the fact is not what Tolkien intended. Also, Tolkien famously did not like the name Return of the King. It was not chosen by him, and it totally does spoil the ending. So next time you think about The Lord of the Rings, try to imagine it as that one huge tome split internally into six parts. I think it does affect the flow of the story, and that is how Tolkien envisioned it. Which brings us to the fantasy side of things. Is Lord of the Rings really fantasy? Well, that question requires much more than a definite yes or no, and obviously everyone is going to have their own relationship with what the word fantasy means, and they're going to have their own relationship with what they get from Tolkien's writings, so I don't want to imply this is like some hard and fast fact. But in my personal opinion, while fantasy certainly isn't the wrong word, it's a lot less precise than it could be. There are two types of fantasy stories. There are fantasy stories that came before Tolkien, and fantasy that came after. Now, it wouldn't quite be accurate to say that the entire genre of fantasy was invented by Tolkien, but if I were to say, close your eyes and picture a quintessential fantasy setting in your mind, I imagine that most of the tropes and ideas and visuals that kind of immediately come to you would come via Tolkien. 
Before Tolkien, there was, of course, Peter Pan, there was The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, there was Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and quite a few others. But these fantastical stories probably aren't what you were just picturing. Let me know if I'm wrong, but I reckon when I said picture a quintessential fantasy setting, you were imagining something closer to modern fantasy. A vaguely medieval time period, a typically northern European aesthetic, elves and dwarves and men possibly fighting orcs or dragons or dark lords. But that's not really what pre-Tolkien fantasy looked like. There are no tall, wise, and beautiful elves in The Wizard of Oz, for example. Back when that was written, the elves of popular fiction were funny little woodland sprites or friends of Santa Claus. Elves like the ones in Middle Earth were not inspired by pre-Tolkienian fantasy stories. They are drawn straight out of much older mythology. Mythology is the word that best describes the Lord of the Rings. Tolkien was a professor of Anglo-Saxon, not a professor of fantasy literature. You may think I'm splitting hairs here, and to be fair, this is not the biggest deal in the world, but I do want to make this point. Modern fantasy is born out of Tolkien's writings, no doubt about that whatsoever, but Tolkien's writings are not born out of the fantasy stories that came before him. Not really. They are born out of the ancient Germanic mythology that Professor Tolkien dedicated his academic life to studying. Lord of the Rings is invented mythology. Anyway, thank you all very much for watching this video. I hope you learned something new, or if not, at least you enjoyed hearing things that you already knew. And if you did enjoy it, be sure to hit like and leave a comment and hit subscribe if you haven't already to make sure you don't miss any future videos. However, as always, until next time, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy and Nevaer Melanine.